Hi, Melissa. I am delighted that you have decided to do this podcast for the Wisdom Project community, where we are trying to collect the experiences of people who uh, finished the foundational program of the Wisdom Project. So why don't we start by introducing who you are, what you do, and what brought you to join us uh, at the Wisdom Project? Sure. So I am Dr. Melissa Duder. I'm a psychiatrist in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm the founder and owner of Sigma Mental Health Urgent Care, which is an innovative medical clinic, uh, actually a chain of clinics where we provide immediate access to mental health care. Um, and um, so I'm the leader here. And I do a lot of, um, of work to grow as a person, mindfulness, uh, business, philosophy, many, many kinds of things to keep my grounding and, and to seek wisdom. And as part of that, I had actually encountered your work by following John Verveke. So he, uh, Dr. Verveke, he did a series on the meaning crisis in the West. And I stumbled upon that somewhere from the mindfulness community, but I was really drawn into his speaking about the meaning crisis as a psychiatrist. So many people are struggling with the kinds of things he was speaking about. And then uh, I saw an interview you did with him about what you were doing and how it was connected, you thought, to the work he had done. And then I contacted you and said, you know, sign me up, basically. <laughs> so you completed the program. And so far, uh... What do you think were the benefits of being a participant of learning this model of implemented wisdom in your day-to-day -day life? Yeah, Ooh, that I mean, it's it's a it's almost a hard question because I feel changed by it in some ways that are hard to articulate. Like, um, I've learned many tools over the course of my professional career and my life to help deal with stress or or ground myself, but many of the things that we learned in the course, I find myself doing automatically, which is not usual with other kinds of tools. And I, I don't know if that's because the way the tools are or the way we learned them, but I find that when I'm stressed, I'm reaching for some of the very specific ways of seeking wisdom and exiting distress that we, that we used within the course. I feel I feel sort of changed by it. I don't I don't know how to say that. Basically what you are saying, and you started doing after the third session, I think, after we did the session where we do mindfulness and open-mindedness. And one of the tools we use is focusing. The yes. That was created by Eugene Gengling. You felt somehow changed. And I was a little surprised that you started immediately using some of the tools in the classroom, in our sessions, in, around your community with your employees sure. and with patients. So can you yes. say? Yes, before I was instructed, actually, because that came later in the course, that I was finding that what I was learning, I was teaching, you know, uh, at, at work, both with patients, with staff, and I was practicing some of the tools. And a um, mindful conversation I had already been talking about pretty early on um, in, in sending, you know, I think you had sent us a transcript of this is how to practice the mindful conversation. And I'd started in the middle of the course by the third session, sending that to people and saying, you know, practice this. I think it would help you. I think speaking to one another this way is something that we don't have enough in our life, enough of um, connection and really truly listening um, and, and, the way the tool is outlined to talk about, you know, matters of the sacred or wisdom or unconditional love or things like that um, encourages a person to, to practice using it, but it can be, it can be used differently, like for conflict or, or for reflection. Um, so I, so I had done that very quickly, kind of incorporated into teaching some of the, uh, the tools that you taught us to others, because they're very helpful. Uh, but, but, but also using them differently. I think that's the other thing is just finding myself. I mean, I think I told you when we spoke about it. So you, at, toward the end of the course, you talked with everybody and said, 
you know, how's it going for you? And I had said something to you there that I, I found that the, um, the body scan was surprisingly something I was using a lot. Yeah, the Vipassana meditation that I call VIP Asana, that is yes. called mindfulness meditation or inside meditation. We call yes. it also the body scan and it made an, uh, an impact. Yeah, well, not, I mean, it not only made an impact, but I just found myself going straight to that when something was bothering me. And so there were the things that I was trying to work with other people and some of the things also I was using within myself and not really thinking about it, just going straight back there, just automatically going there and benefiting from it, which is, that was unexpected for me. And also you said something about being in flow before we even touched the topic of flow, which comes around the sixth session, because I try to create flow, but I don't speak about it. Mm -hmm. It's about experience and practice. And then after people have had the experience, I bring the concept. So are you still living in flow like you were? You can say no, because. Yeah, um, I would say, I would say no, but I'm more, of, I'm more aware of um, how or why. I mean, I, I'm, I'm finding so at work, and I think, I think I talked to you about this, that when I'm in the room with the patient, it's very much in flow, but in the hallway, when I have to rush, when there's paper to sign, when there's someone to get on the phone and do a prior authorization, I hadn't so much been there. And I, and I think I was over, um, in my mental accounting, I was over weighing the, the not in flow time in comparison to the inflow time. And just the awareness of actually how much time I spend in flow and when I exit and return has been really, really helpful actually uh, for my sense of uh, just being more oriented and, um, and, and happy in my role, if that makes sense. I think I was, as we would do, right? My mind and the instrument of looking for problems was focused on the problem of those minutes where I was stressed, but there are many, many more minutes where I'm not stressed. Like the, the it's, it's an order of magnitude really is I'm in the room for an hour and I'm in the hallway for two minutes, but I was really focused on those two minutes being unpleasant. And I can see the difference much more clearly now. So would it be fair to say that through these seven sessions or during those seven weeks, you were able to reframe how you experience your work life? Oh, that would absolutely be uh, appropriate to say that. To reframe and then to develop a process to continue to reframe. I'm not finished. It, it goes on. Yeah, like when Ricky says that wisdom is something that we can cultivate through these cognitive styles and psychotechnologies that... I call the skills and the tools of the Wisdom Project. Therefore, it's just a beginning to take the foundational course. For sure. And Melissa, I know that you have a very ambitious project with your professional life. Uh, you have written two books. You I, want to expand the model of care that you basically innovated on, that you have created for your community. Would you say that this new awareness that you gain with the Wisdom Project would help you manifest that? And can you share with people who listen to this uh, podcast, what is your goal? What is your big project of changing psychiatry? If, if yeah, I absolutely. I mean, my big, my big goal is to change the way psychiatry is practiced um, in this country and, and broader because as I, I'm, I think we had another outside conversation, but I'll try to summarize that, you know, there are two models of psychiatric practice. One is as if it's uh, primary care general medicine. So we take a few quick minutes, we apply medication um, to the diagnosis. We're diagnosis focused, biologically focused. It has to necessarily be very quick. There's not enough time and space. And, and we throw some medication in and off we go. And then the other model is a more psychoanalysis space, taking long periods of time, digging into the origins of things. And I think both of those are problematic. I, I think the research data on psychiatry 
tells us that the most important thing is early intervention at the appropriate level, intervening when someone has a stressor, has a crisis. And if it is situational, it's a breakup, offering support and reassurance. If it's the onset of a serious illness, providing medical treatment for that early, but meeting people at the right level and not treating everyone the same, but but addressing their needs differently as soon as possible. And that's what's not being done. So in both of the models, if it's primarily seen as like a outpatient medical care, or if it's seen as therapy, there are long, long wait times. And what we find is that people get worse and that it, it just, it alters the course of illness. It heightens the problem. And, and people's entire lives are altered by a three month wait or a six month wait for psychiatric care. And so like, for example, if you have someone who has a breakup and they're depressed and hopeless and they get no support and reassurance that this is a normal response to stress, that can become depression, that can become worse. Or if you have someone who has the onset of something like schizophrenia and you provide no medical care for that for three months or six months, it can become so severe that it follows that person for the rest of their lives. And so early intervention is key. And I mean, immediately today, you, your loved one has a, a crisis of your mental health. You need attention for that immediately. Um, you shouldn't wait a week. You shouldn't certainly wait three months or six months. I think if we could do that, we can really turn this, the, the, the whole profession around but there's a resistance in the way that the culture of the practice of psychiatry is, is followed within the field. And so it, it takes kind of the proof of concept to come in here and do it and show people it can be got, done and teach them how and lead the way to make that change. So it's a big job that I'm trying to do. So the network of clinics that you have created in San Antonio, Texas, in around San Antonio, and now you're moving far away from San Antonio to Houston, Texas? To, uh, to Austin. To Austin, Texas. Um, that Which is not that far. <laughs> it's not too far. Okay. That model is working. Mm -hmm. can the I, model is working. Can I be ambitious enough and you can say no to ask, how do you think establishing our relationship, getting to know a way of cultivating your flow, flowing life, flowing work, has contributed or you think will contribute? I know that one of the reasons you joined is because the promise of creating a community of people like mm -hmm. ourselves to mm -hmm. continue exploring this under the inspiration and framework, framework that John Berbicki offered. So how do you think your big, big dream? Yeah, I, I think- Because I also have a big dream. Yes, I- <laughs> Wisdom. Yeah, I, I feel like- you are helping me get myself out of the way. If that makes sense, that so many, you know, old stories or ways of doing things or fears or things being in the way that the, the use of the tools of the Wisdom Project is helping me clear them out of the way and move forward without those obstacles that, that really come from me. I, the obstacle is me, right? Um, but I'm, I'm really seeing clearly and moving through processes that get me beyond those obstacles. And relying on the community, relying on the conversations with each other to move ourselves away from the limitations and towards the expansion of what we call the imaginal self who will manifest our projects. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and for me so far, like the community is just getting going, right? I look so forward to the community because when we were meeting in my course, which ended about a month ago, um, that was such an important part for me. And then the the they're, now they're lighter meetings, um, but, but having that, I don't know, people like-minded people to talk with and interact with, um, it's, I think, so important. It's a reminder. It lights the way. I, I, I look forward to more of that as you're building it. Yes, yes, yes. And you're inviting to give us ideas on how to continue developing the community because that's what's going to be central. Thomas launched, my husband launched the community Saturday night and Sunday morning he was like, wow, Melissa's side. I did. 
I did as soon as I got the email. Timing. <laughs> yes, yes. And then I looked at the, you know, there's an app and I looked at the app and I'm excited um, about how it works and I'm excited to learn, I, you know, how, how it will all fit together and how we'll talk to each other and continue growing this. All right. So um, is there anything else you would like to add? I am really grateful that you wanted to do this podcast because yeah. people said, oh, it's so difficult to explain what is that we do in the Wisdom Project. I, I just, I would say thank you. I can't thank you enough for your courage to break through your own to your own imaginal self and do what your heart was leading you to do. Yes. It's very, very wonderful what you're doing. And now so we are think. lucky to have each other, to accompany each other on the journey. Absolutely. Okay, Melissa, thank you very much. And I'll see you soon in one of our gatherings.